I will hit record and we can get going. First of all, how did everyone feel about the uh, governor's recent announcement of Minnesota starting a plan for opening up? <laughs> if you did not hear this, I encourage uh, check out the news. I can drop a, <coughs> a summary in the a link. But uh, last week we talked about externalities. Um, would love to hear from those of you that watched the Netflix uh, Explain series, The World's Water Crisis. What were your reactions from that? Don't all share at once. All right, well, I will just move on to uh, our agenda today. <clears throat> we do have a full agenda, so do wanna get started with that. Um, realizing that we are a little over a month uh, left in the class, I do wanna make sure that we're uh, putting the offer out and I'll follow up with an email after class today. Um, but. For those of you that would like to meet with myself, meet with Greg, Leah, you do have a number of resources in this class. And I know many of you are graduating seniors or juniors that are gonna be looking for uh, roles of the summer. Whether you have a role already committed and you wanna to continue to network with professionals, um, you know, and if we can support you uh, in that, you know, please let us know. We didn't make that a requirement to have one-on-one -on -one meetings. I know a few of you have already taken advantage of it, um, but we wanna make sure we're supporting you. Uh, as we've heard back from clients, you're really doing an incredible job. Um, you know, they are so thankful to have your support. Um, so I just wanna make sure we're getting that out there. Uh, also uh, have started grading. I'll, we'll finish that this week for both the research and the project plan. So you'll have that before class Thursday. Um, we have a couple student presentations today and then excited for Houston White, uh, who will be our guest speaker joining us in a little bit. Before we get started with any of that, do we want to go through quick uh, student org updates? For net impact this week, we have our flagship event, Gophers Go to Work, which is a one day consulting event where we're bringing local nonprofits in. And you'll be paired with a team of about three or four other students, and you'll work on some of the issues they're currently facing. Um, so if you're interested in that, I'll drop the link. It's at 7 p.m. on Wednesday night. Excellent. Thank you. Any other updates? Um, I have an update. Um, so Business Board, like Carlson's like student government, is um, having like elections soon. So if you're interested in this leadership position, um, we're having an info session on March 18th and I can drop the details in the chat. Awesome, thank you so much. Anything else? Um, the Panhellenic Council, which is kind of the governing body for all sororities on campus is having a DEI talk tonight with Africa America drag queen. He's like talking about intersectionality of like your day life and your drag life and all these really cool like DI topics and it's open to anyone if you want to come. Awesome, and do you mind doing the same if there's details to drop it in the chat? Thank you. Lots going on this week. Um, well, with that, do we want to get started? We have three presentations today as well. I can Any go first if that's all right. Yeah, thank you. Sounds good. All right, could you enable the screen sharing quick, Matt? That might make this easier. Thank you. There you go. Thanks. All righty, are you seeing this okay? Cool. All right, I'll go ahead and present it. All righty, so my um, research project was on Epimonia. Um, they're a for profit organization located here in the cities. And um, the organization's mission is to spread hope and love through providing support for refugees in the US uh, with the opportunity for education and advancement. And so they do all this 
by kind of following this three-step approach that you can see at the bottom there. Um, largely, Epimonia serves as more of a symbolic gesture of support for refugees, but they also have campaigns and partnerships that have tangible impacts on the lives of refugees here as well. Um, and we'll see more of that looking at the next page here. But um, the organization collects life jackets that were previously worn by refugees. So on that first page, um, these are life jackets that have washed up on like the shores of Greece and such from um, large migrations of people fleeing conflict and things and seeking refuge. So um, the organization takes those that are no longer usable and up upcycles them into articles of clothing um, or other accessories and things. And then those proceeds from those products that are um, bought by consumers are donated to organizations that have a more direct impact on the lives of refugees, whether that's like through improving housing or employment or scholarships and things of that sort. So um, this bracelet that you see here was actually kind of where it all started. So this was the organization's first product. And since then they've expanded into making like hats and t-shirts, other um, accessory items. And since the creation of Epimonia in 2018, the organization has donated $45,000 to refugees um, and refugee causes. And it, then they've invested $102,000 into changing the narrative surrounding refugees. Um, then more of almost more than 500 uh, life jackets have been recycled as well through their impact. So um, I had the privilege of speaking with Mohammed. Um, he's the founder and creator of Epimonia. And so we weren't able to talk face to face, unfortunately, with our schedules, but he, we were able to um, communicate via email. And he was very gracious with, with his time and sharing some of his story with me. So as we were talking, he provided me with some more insight into his life and what led him to create Epimonia, which was super awesome. So as a Somali refugee himself, he was inspired to create Epimonia. Um, because he had a very positive experience he and his family did um, as they were fleeing conflict and coming to America, they were kind of welcomed with open arms and given lots of support during that time. And growing up, he realized that not everyone had that same experience um, and that refugees were being portrayed very differently than you know how he felt about himself and his family and his peers, especially during the Trump administration. So um, being that not everybody had that same experience, he created Epimonia. Uh, out of his business education at University of St. Thomas with the mission to change the narrative of the way that refugees are portrayed in the media and also to ensure that other families seeking refuge have the same positive and impactful experiences that his family did. So that is what I have. Any questions at all? Thank you so much. So did he share uh, how much of the focus has been on the business of the products itself versus the kind of broader, you know, mission and movement that I feel like he's created. Yeah, he, I asked him kind of like what he sees as a growth opportunity and he is a little more focused on the business aspect of it. He thinks that the tangible kind of donation parts is really what's driving that larger speech about refugees and how they're portrayed in the media. So that's what he felt the Epimonia's uh, focus was on right now. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Who would like to go next? I can go. Is that okay, Spencer? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, cool. <clears throat> All right. Can you guys see this okay? Okay, cool. Um, so today I just want to talk to you about Breaking Bread Cafe. It is a social enterprise here in North Minneapolis. But in order to kind of understand breaking bread, you have to first understand Appetite for Change. So it has a super similar setup as Pollen does, if like any of you remember it. I know I'm actually on the Pollen team, so it's funny how that worked. But it's that this is kind of the social enterprise that is supporting the nonprofit, which would be um, Appetite for Change. So its mission then really is to support appetite for change and they see food as a tool for health, wealth and social, social change in North Minneapolis. And with Breaking Bread being there, it allows a, a space for community um, to meet your friends and also meet like local leaders and to bring people together and learn to cook and eat and grow food and just grow as humans. And it also allows um, employment and job training and in hopes to that other businesses will kind of continue coming to North Minneapolis. So Breaking Bread is currently closed because of COVID. 
Um, I know on their website, it said it was supposed to open in April, 2020. So obviously we're coming up on a year now. So hopefully something will change soon, but they have fresh global comfort foods um, and they kind of like honor black, historically like black culture and their foods. So I really hope they open soon because I really wanna try it. The food looks amazing. Um, but another part about Appetite for Change is that they see food as the key to nourishing wellness, um, but there are a lot of systemic issues that stand in the way. So a few of the ways that Appetite for Change kind of works and where some of the money from breaking bread goes fall into four categories. The first being community cooks. So they offer workshops to teach people how to cook and to support their wellness. And then urban agriculture, they actually have seven different plots where they can garden in North Minneapolis. And that kind of works twofold because not only can they then distribute this food throughout North Minneapolis, but also teaching people how to garden and like provide for themselves. Um, and then there's training that they offer. So teaching people how they can be change agents in their own lives. And then finally, Northside Fresh, which is a network of a variety of people from different backgrounds and different careers um, who are interested in food justice. So a few stats that are really cool because breaking bread, obviously, like I said, isn't working right now, but Appetite for Change is still getting food out. So there are 50 different distribution sites and already this year they've um, delivered over 330,000 meals and it comes to about a thousand meals delivered a day. It's really exciting that they're still able to do this um, even without breaking bread. They have a few different ways to kind of get revenue. They have some partners like the Cargill Foundation, Better Futures Minnesota, and then they also have um, this site in the depot, the St. Paul depot, where they sell food and they have a farmer's market as well. Um, but one other little thing, I know I'm just kind of all over the place because the information I got is just like everywhere, but it was just also interesting to me is that they have three different founders, Princess Tasha and Michelle, and they all come from different parts of the US. They have different socioeconomic and ethnic backgrounds. And when I was kind of reading about them, it sounds like they kind of bicker a lot and like they, they don't always see eye to eye, but they come together around this sense of like food, community, and social justice. And it, it's just really like empowering, especially I feel like in the world we're living in, there's a lot of divisiveness um, and challenges to see eye to eye and with their different backgrounds and different experiences, they're still able to find kind of common ground and obviously work together to do something that's so impactful um, and necessary for so many people. So hopefully like maybe by the end of this class, I'll have news that they're open. I'm still trying to talk to someone. Um, so I'll keep you guys updated and then hopefully maybe there can be like a field trip, <laughs> but that's it for me. like it. Great job. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I think that is uh, really important that you started from the get-go of this is a theme that we've started to see of essentially having earned revenue programs within a larger organization. I think we saw it with Raise MN as well. All right, one more presentation. So I am going to be... <laughs> Leah, Leah kind of mentioned how we're both on the, we're both on the Pollen team, which for those of you who have forgotten is a creative agency. Um, and <laughs> we both kind of did social enterprises kind of along the same lines. Um, as you see here, I had the opportunity to learn a little bit more about Youth Lens 360. And what they are is they are a um, for-profit social enterprise that takes students in the K through 12 system, traditionally ages 14 to 24. And they give them the opportunity to get real world experience in a real job setting through the lens of creative storytelling. Um, so Paulin has their, their um, diverse network of freelancers, but Youth Funds 360 takes students and trains them in the creative um, graphic design world. So breaking down what they do, they have digital strategy, digital marketing, and digital management. That strategy component is pretty much how they're going to approach um, the client project and how they're going to really meet those needs. Marketing is your content creation. So they do videography, photography, graphic design, storytelling, um, whatever you need, they're there for you. And what's really cool about it is you get the, the youth lens perspective, hence their name, 
Um, and that's a big competitive advantage that they really rely on is you get in the perspective of the youth and that really refreshes a lot of stories that they're working with, with for, the, for their clients. And then their digital management. So how they're executing all this content that they created and pretty much how, when, and where they're getting it to their, um, to the audience, essentially. I was fortunate to, uh, I was fortunate enough to talk to the CEO and founder, Gary Oterio. And he, uh, first and foremost, very cool guy. Uh, I had a, just a great time talking to him and learning just a little more about his experience and just like his motives behind the organization. And he actually, uh, his story was very unique as well. So the the students that they traditionally work with are in underserved communities and don't necessarily find their passion in the traditional school system. Um, he himself graduated with a 1.8 GPA in high school, but had the opportunity to go through a program it was also like a second chance boost your GPA type program, where it was a lot of like execution focus. So he was doing a lot of projects, a lot of um, group work, a lot of internships. One of those internships he was doing was teaching graphic design to students in these underserved communities. And that's really where he saw the opportunity that, hey, although these students may not be excelling by the looks of their grades in school, they have that creative passion and they have that opportunity to make a difference to that creative avenue. But for the most part, it was just not being tapped into. So that's where he founded this organization. And they really, center it on the entrepreneurial mindset. He said a big misconception of the org is that they are a nonprofit, but they stay in the for-profit lens where the clients pay for their work and the, they then pay their students and then, you know, continue with the profits. But they really center on that entrepreneurial mindset, teaching students, you know, what the real world is like. On top of the, the creative work that they do, they're also taught financial literacy, real world job advice, and a bunch of other um, life skills. They're actually developing a nonprofit arm here in the near future that's really centered on creating the holistic picture of developing these students and really preparing them for the real world. And then just looking at some of their clients, uh, they have a lot of big name clients too. So it, that's really cool to see that these students are really making a difference in the community around them from startups to the state of Minnesota. Um, they're really all over the board. So it's cool to see that they're really making an impact in the community and like the whole state. So yeah, uh, are there any questions? So as someone who has the insight of working with both Pollen and Youth Lens 360, what would you say are similarities or differences? Yeah, so they're both very socially driven in the aspect like the clients that they work with um, have that, that social aspect to them. And they both have a very unique preposition. Pollen has the aspect where the, the marketing, the creative agency, the industry as a whole in the Twin Cities market is um, largely comprised of white individuals. And Pollen comes from the lived in experience of having this diverse BIPOC community of freelancers. Um, that, like I said, they provide a lived in experience, whereas most of the industry is providing an outsider perspective on these projects they're working with. And then as for youth lens, they're getting the student perspective. And like I said, it is primarily um, students in underserved communities. So again, that lived in experience and also that, that student, that youth perspective on a lot of the clients is just not something that you tr uh, traditionally see in the creative agency. Yeah, well, great job on uh, both the presentation and the continued project you're doing with Pollen. All right, I am super excited. We have a special guest with us today. Houston White, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're gonna spend some time learning both uh, Houston's story, specifically the work he's doing in Camden Town. He is, I think, a lifelong entrepreneur, but uh, really reinvented. Uh, you know, I wanna hear a little bit about that career journey from Houston, if you wouldn't mind sharing about uh, what you had done up until, you know, 2006 timeframe, and then really kind of this renewed uh, focus on community building. Um, and then uh, we'll spend the first probably 20 minutes or so, I'll have a couple like uh, general Q&A, and then we want to make sure we're opening it up to student questions as well. Yeah, Matthew, Th thank you for, uh, thank you for inviting me, man. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, my name is Houston White. I am a lifelong entrepreneur, as you said. I, 
I've never had a W-2 job in my life. Uh, I'm from, from Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, I recently finished a manuscript and the first chapter is called uh, Foundation of Knowledge, Lessons from My African Village. Um, and the reality is Mississippi, as we know, is probably one of the most front facing racist places on the planet. But for black kids, the reality is tribalism helps you not develop an inferiority complex. The mayor is black, the police chief is black, most of the shop owners are black. And so you grow up feeling like black is perfectly suitable to do whatever <clears throat> you want, you know? And so when I was young, most of my family were entrepreneurs. Um, I went from building houses on the weekends to learning to build beds, you know, during the week to my grandmother being a master baker who sold cakes. And so that was just what I was exposed to. And so at seven, I told my mom, I never want to have a job, right? Like I, I never want to go to nine to five work. And she told me your gifts will make room for you. Um, and, and that's been the case. You know, I've, I started my first business when I was eight, nine. And by the time I was 15, I was making more money than my mom cutting hair in the basement. And that's a true story. Just using God-given talent. I always say to people like LeBron James uh, wasn't taught <clears throat> how to be who he is. It was born in him. Um, but so many of prominent black um, entertainers, um, thought leaders, Malcolm X never went to college, right? And so not that college isn't important, it is, but it's not a prerequisite for success. And so um, that's been my journey, right? Like just this bad, this constant um, evolution as an entrepreneur. When I was about 25, I started a company, um, HY Custom Homes, we were building custom homes. And our niche was that we were building for upwardly mobile black folks who, you know, Minnesota is a very transient state. So you get all these black folks who come here from Florida, Atlanta, and all these places, and they're trying to find their way. They're trying to find a builder that speaks their language. And at the time, Cribs was super popular. I don't know, you guys are young, so I don't know if you, <laughs> if you were watching Cribs, but <clears throat> my thing was to, to deconstruct uh, what was happening on Cribs and then reconstruct it into a business that really uh, resonated powerfully with people who had money, but also had culture. And so we built this construction firm that grew to 40 million in sales in 2006. And the recession of 2007 and eight came that was a difficult time for me because I had to reinvent myself. I mean, I was 29 years old and I was crushing it till I wasn't <laughs> uh, because the realities of the world, the banks weren't lending money and people were jumping out of buildings in, in, in New York and it just seemed like things were coming apart. And so I decided at that moment that I was the black guy who had made it. But what I was missing more than anything was my tribe, that, that, that same connection that I had in Mississippi. What I did is I got wealthy and I got out. I went to the burbs, you know, um, and I realized that that wasn't, I had never experienced anything like that, that really made me think about how isolated I was. And yeah, I had money, but I didn't have the people. And so at that time, I tried to figure out what next. And I said to myself, I'm going to go back to my roots, like when I was a kid in the basement. So I looked for real estate to buy. I was still a real estate guy. And I looked at a bunch of different buildings. I started in Golden Valley. I started Northeast because I really didn't think I could do what I wanted to do in North Minneapolis, to be honest. I just didn't think that the neighborhood would accept it or ready for it. Um, yeah, I'm a black man and I'm from North Minneapolis, but I still was dealing with the issues of crime. All those things is that I had to think through. And I just decided that if not me, who? If not now, when? And I found a building that I really liked and I bought it. Um, and I decided that I was gonna use that building um, as a catalyst, everything that I had learned from my business development, my entrepreneurial career, and build this in, this vertically integrated enterprise that can really impact a uh, community. And that's really the root of, of what I've been doing is taking a place that's very culturally uh, relevant and building um, community around it. And that's what sparked uh, Camden Town, this what we call people-based placemaking strategy that's really about a place of black excellence, black joy, black, black ownership and black futurism. Um, I believe that Minnesota has the disparities that it has because of um, a lack of thriving, successful um, community that really um, resonates powerfully with, with black people.
Thank you. And so, Houston, uh, first of all, it's so impressive how much you've done so quickly. And then, like you said, reinventing yourself. So when you bought the property then in North Minneapolis, did you know what was the first business you wanted to start with? Because as now you've talked about, it's very multifaceted, multidimensional. You're in a lot of different lanes. You know, how did you start? And then how do you continue to manage? you know, multiple brands. The most important thing for me was for it to be exceptional. Um, oftentimes when we think of urban sections, um, they're not places that you would necessarily associate with exceptionalism. And most people, you know, like 50th in France is something that people would say, this is this is beautiful, right? Or uh, we go to Bloomington from all of America and that's exceptional. So first things first was to really make like something that um, could be anywhere. And then it was the barbershop. Um, in, in 1838, 13 of the 16 richest black men in America were barbers because white men didn't do service work. And so the barbershop has this long, long standing reputation for being one of the first places for black men to be entrepreneurs. And so I needed it to be, you know, built on something that was authentic to the culture. And that was a, a, a place of, of, um, a place of strength for us because it couldn't be co-opted. You can't just make a black barbershop because you have the money. You really have to live and know and understand the culture. Yeah. When I, I think also when you speak to just the, the focus on community building, that that creates a unique environment. Um, okay, so you have all this going and then do you mind sharing about juxtaposition for arts? <laughs> Yeah, you know, so I was the first student of Juxta, um, and it wasn't a thing yet. I just had a, um, he, he's now my good friend, but he was a student of North High that had gone to Chicago Institute of Art, and um, our professor just thought we, we needed somebody that was more relatable. Um, and so he brought him in as kind of a, a guest instructor, and we just hit it off. Um, and I was an entrepreneur in high school, and so we traded haircuts for him teaching me one-to-one -one. <laughs> the stuff that he had learned. I cut his hair and he gave me, um, he let me use his equipment and he taught me. And so I would make like a hundred t-shirts a week at his studio and sell them in North. Uh, and then uh, when I was going down South for the summer, my classmates were like, Hey, can we come? And so they would start to come and hang out with Peyton. And it's like, 20, 30 kids, well, about 20, 25 kids in his place. And he's like, well, I'm an artist. I don't run a youth program. Um, and so that kind of started what became Juxta because you had uh, Peyton and Roger, who are two artists, two, two guy guys who knew nothing about operations. And Deanna, uh, Roger's wife, came in and kind of helped put some structure to it. Um, and that was really like the, the catalyst. It was just a feasibility. It was just people being mentors to kids that created now what is an amazing arts program and a pillar of, of North Side community. Yeah, no, that's incredible. And so I want to spend a little time talking about this idea of mentorship or leadership. I mean, from a very young age, you talked about, you knew you were going to be an entrepreneur. You didn't want to have a job. It's great in vision, but, but how did that become practicality? Who were the, the role models in your life? Who did you learn from? And how have you continued to provide that support for you know, other students and youth today? Yeah, I mean, kids in college, I mean, you all, the probably the most valuable stuff that you're gonna do is your internship. You know, I mean, that's where you're really gonna learn what the hell is going on. You know, you can't become a doctor unless you go through residency, right? That's where you really learn how to practice medicine. Uh, and so that was, that was my reality. Um, I have had mentors in every single thing that I've ever done from, from art, you know, one-to-one -one folks who they're professionals, they're higher level than me. And I get underneath them and learn from them and then take that to the world. And so when I first started building houses, there was a guy, uh, Jamie, I'm blanking on his last name, but he had built, built houses for 20 years. And so it's how I became addicted to Red Bull early on because <laughs> I went to his, his office and he had a fridge and there was nothing in there but Red Bull. <laughs> what the hell is this? And so he gave me one and that became my thing. So I became known as the guy who had, you know, Red Bull cans littered all over job sites. But that's how I learned the finer points of construction management. 
is sitting there learning from him, asking him questions, buying him cases of Red Bull, <laughs> and just asking all kinds of questions and staying close. And and it's still that, like that to this day. You know, Kathy Tunheim. You know, she's she's. If you don't know her, look her up. She's a, a, a brilliant strategist and PR mind and a legend in Minnesota. Um, she and I got to know each other in 2015 and she really helped me as I was moving to my next level of entrepreneurship, think through the things that I needed to strip away. Because most entrepreneurs think they can do everything, right? And so you keep just, yes, yes, yes. And she taught me, you have to say no. <laughs> because you got to get to the the core right of what you're trying to accomplish and we drive ourselves to a place where we that creativity just wanes because we're trying to do too much so i mean there's been any number of them i mean i, I find a new one every day some of them are remote and some of them are are actual people um but it's it's critical to the journey man yeah and so have you found that you have kind of a a sounding board for each of the different venues and ventures that you're in today, or is it more about having kind of that holistic support and you can bounce ideas for any of the ventures you're doing? Yeah, it's a little of both. I mean, there are people who, you know, you just, they become what, what uh, Nate Garvis calls trusted guides, you know, and they're more general. It's just like, let me bounce this off of you and see what you think. And then there are people who are very specific, um, like, Andy Cesari, who runs, you know, the CEO of US Bank, you know, he's a numbers guy. If you want to know numbers, there's no one better to learn from than the CEO of the fifth largest bank in the, in the country. So, uh, but he's not like gonna sit there and maybe hang out and drink a beer, all right? Like they're different, different people for different things, and and I'm okay with that. Um, and it's necessary. If you don't have a diverse group of mentors, man, you're Everybody on this call is grown. You're fucked. Sorry for. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I appreciate it. And so, do you mind talking a little more about, especially this idea of cross sector partnership? And you talked about U.S. Bank. Um, you know, I, I think it's really important, especially as you're getting things off the ground, making sure you, you have that type of support across sectors. Yeah. The, so my 2019 2020 um, business like. My, the words, I always try to find a theme for what I'm working on in a certain section. And the idea was culture plus capacity. Um, and, and I used that to talk to um, US Bank, to Target, to United Properties, all companies that I have partnerships with. And the idea is that you have the capacity, you, got, you have the machine, I'm the culture. You know, one of the things that you've been missing, right, in terms of if Target says, well, we don't like our position in, in, with, with our Black guests, how do we improve that? You, you can't improve it unless you find somebody who knows how to speak the language of those guests. Um, and so same thing with U.S. Bank. Banks are, in the Black community, one of the most mistrusted institutions that exist, by, right up there with the police. Um, but how do you figure out how to speak this language? How do you figure out how to um, engage with a community as culture plus capacity? So, I mean, and it's critical because um, I use music a lot, but Dr. Dre, for instance, had the, the chronic already completed. He took it to 19 labels and they all said no. I mean, can you believe it? Like now, like really? But he made that in his room. It was already done. He didn't need like someone to help him make the music. He needed a machine to get the music distributed to the world. And so that's kind of how I look at building those relationships. You know, I don't need to be taught. You know, I need partners to help me, you know, highlight the work that we're already doing. And so I do want to make sure we're pausing. Um, others, as you have questions, please feel free either you can do the raise your hand function, feel free to speak up, otherwise use the chat bar as well. And one of the questions that came in was out of all your ventures, is there one that's been your favorite or a favorite point on your journey thus far? Oh, my favorite. That's like saying like it's <clears throat> one of your kids, your favorite. <laughs> I don't know if you can say that. Um, uh, but of course, um, I, think, I think they rank differently, you know? Um, I, I think the most important one by far is the barbershop. That's the most important one because um, it's really about community. I mean, other things that I've done have been more about money, 
uh, more about scale. Um, but the barbershop has this ability to, to be a conduit to all different kinds of people. I mean, I've hosted Archbishop Hebda at my barbershop on Martin Luther King Day. And there's a funny story, you know, that uh, one of my friends told. He goes back to his law office and says, Archbishop Hebda is the only white dude that ever outblinked black dudes at a black barbershop because he had the cross on and it was just like <laughs> blinging. <you know? laughs> But it was just like this super cool cultural moment where it was like, you know, the barbershop was this place that was bringing him and we could have a fun conversation and we're different. Um, but I think also when I when I created the partnership with JC Penny was one of those like moments where you feel like, damn, I made it, right? Like when you go into a, a, a store and you see shirts that you made in there and folks all over the country sending you pictures of, a garment that you know you I started doing this at like 12 years old in my basement and to see like all over the country shirts that I made so that was probably one of the ones where it was just like yeah man it's like I made it right and so yeah I love it thank you um Ian I believe we have a, a quite another question yeah um hi Houston first of all I just wanted to say I appreciate you for making the time to come and talk to us today um, but yeah, my question is, so I am also interested in kind of social entrepreneurship, um, but I do come from like a background of privilege. So it's kind of tough for me to like, I don't know, like understand some of the struggles that uh, underserved communities go through. Uh, that being said, I guess, I just wanted to know if you had any like anything that I should be keeping, <clears throat> anything that I should keep in mind as I'm looking to um, I guess serve my community here in like the Twin Cities, um, just being like a guy who really hasn't had to experience any sort of discrimination in my life. Yeah, you know, first and foremost, leverage your privilege, you know, leverage it. My best friend is, is German Irish and went to Harvard. He always jokes that he was third in his class and he was right in front of Barack Obama. Uh, but he's 57 years old and he's my best friend, right? And we're different very different but that's what makes the relationship it's so unique um so i think leveraging your privilege and being a part of things that you can you can literally be a conduit to other parts of the world and and, and translate language and get things accomplished for communities that you feel like deserve the same um, opportunities that you had you know, um, and it's not donation. It's about like showing up. It's about being present. It's about being on the ground. Um, and so I would encourage you just to get out, get involved and really just bring what you got to the table. You know, look at Def Jam, you know, Rick Rubin and um, uh, Rick Rubin and, and I'm blanking on his name right now. Uh, gosh, why can't I remember his name? Come on, Russell Simmons. It couldn't be more different, right? Rick Rubin's from South Dakota, Russell Simmons from Queens, and these guys created probably the most formidable record label in the history of hip hop. They produced P.E., the Beastie Boys, LL Cool J. So I think there is this cultural collision that's a good thing, so. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Ian, thank you for the question. I think, one, just the acknowledgement of those type of questions is so important. But you're in a room right now with Houston, you're continuing to be intentional of who you're surrounding yourself with. I think that idea of building your own council and making sure it's reflective, you know, of, of where you want to be supporting community is so important. Do we have other questions? I have a ton, so I can keep going, but I want to make sure I'm giving pause to uh, each of you students as you have the opportunity to ask. Yeah, is there anything that you uh, got into that you realized, like, I don't want to be doing this long term or like, this is not for me? Oh, hell yeah. Um, I got into um, um, politics. <laughs> Uh, and, and not like I was running for office, but uh, more so um, there was a school choice fight. There was an, uh, a, a proposal to have, um, some people call it vouchers, <clears throat> but it was the opportunity scholarship 
Um, this was back in 2017. And so I spent the better part of six months of my life fighting this fight with the teachers union and and going to the Capitol every single day and having dinner with wealthy donors and just, and I realized that that's not my calling in life. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a business guy. I can affect the world best by staying in that lane. <laughs> and so that was one of the things that I realized that uh, it was a great lesson for me though. Um, I'm, I'm not a politician and I'm not built for that world. Um, and I wasn't doing it to be a politician. I was, I really honestly thought that I could help. Realize not so much. <laughs> I have a, another question for you. You've spoken about kind of using your talents and gifts that you've had um, to really better the world. How would you say you've like honed in on those gifts and made sure to like constantly develop them and yourself and like figuring out your passions and your lane? That's a great question. I always remind my mentor, um, don't major in minor things. Um, he was a, he's a fixer guy. And so one, um, one weekend at the cabin, his mom's uh, dry, dish, uh, washer had broken. And so he decided he was gonna fix it. So he goes into the town and he gets the parts and he does all this stuff and it's a set, it's a beautiful Saturday. And he, he finally gets it completed that Sunday afternoon when we're about to drive back to Minneapolis. His mom looks at him and says, thank you so much. I love it, you did a great job but that is the most expensive dryer in North America. You know, he bills out at whatever house. So in this idea, you could have bought the damn dryer, a new one for 200 or bought for a couple hundred bucks, but you spent all your time and bandwidth trying to uh, be a hero. And so for me, I, I've learned to really areas that I'm strong, I focus in on and I find people who can compliment me in other areas. Um, and, and I know that my, my biggest strength is I'm, a, I'm an ideas guy. I'm a, I'm a visionary and I can paint a picture that can be executed on. Um, and I try to not micromanage people that I trust to help me, you know, and it's, it's how I'm able to have eight or nine things happen at one time, you know, is really leveraging, painting a clear picture uh, but then leveraging the talents of others. Um, and it's a, it's an exercise. I have to remind myself all the time to, Hey, you're, you're creeping, you know? <laughs> uh, and so it's a, it's a discipline that you develop, but yeah. Thank you. And so as you talk about those, uh, complimentary, you know, skills, individuals, Houston, where have you gone out, you know, in your life and community, you know, and, and found those? Uh, is there a common theme, place, you know, environment, et cetera? Oh, man. I, no, no, I'm a people person, right? You get a vibe from people. Um, for instance, April Rorden, who, who linked us up, right? Like she was working at Big Brother, Big Sister, and um, I was asked to speak and and we met and we vibe and we did a couple things together. And based on our mutual connection and our affinity, now we're working together and, and with Camden Town, you know, and these, I think it's just, you meet people and you realize that there's synergies there. Um, and I'm all about diversity of, of lived experience and thought, you know, I mean, most people would think like, you're very uh, black, why don't you have more black people? That's, and I do have tons of black people, but I need diversity to move ideas forward. I don't, I, I need people, I need good people. Um, and it, it's good to have different lived experiences, no different than if I tell a corporation, you need me the same way I need other folks. So I think you just find them, man. Like you, you really have to, you talk to, you talk to folks and, and it's that gut test. You know, does this person feel, does it feel right? Are you, are you, do you feel like this is the, the right person to work with? And then you just, you just go. I love it. Well, I do keep pausing only so others have a chance to, to ask. Um, but I do would love to know from your perspective, because we are in a 
unique moment in time where, you know, a, a lot of life has happened. And you talked about, you know, that there's been this awakening this last year, um, you know, and I see that. And, and also at the same time, this focus on creating black mobility. What organizations do you see in the community are doing that best, you know, are, are serving and, and trying to really be intentional about that? What organizations are doing it best? Um, it's a great question. I think, uh, to be honest, I think most organizations have realized um, the gaps. I think people are well intended, um, but the target is off because you can't mobilize black without building community. You know, it's kind of um, counterintuitive. It's like, if people don't have a place to go to that's reflective that they can uh, invest in and live in and be a part of mobilizing more black employment, it just is gonna create the same carous will of, of folks leaving this state after they realize they don't have a tribe, you know? I, I think that we have these disparities because of lack of community. That's why Camden Town was created, to be a, here's a baseline. Now let's build off of that, it's the foundation. Um, so I think there are a lot of groups, man, they're doing great work. I think the foundations have, have, have finally gotten together and realized that um, they have to catalyze human potential. Um, a lot of nonprofits, for instance, if you do an empathy map, you'll see that most of the people that make the decisions are, are white, you know, that are on the board. So how can you truly um, create a nonprofit that's gonna benefit a certain cause if the people who are really behind the scenes making decisions don't even really have a lived experience, it's tough. So I think we're in this moment where folks are, are realizing um, that we have to shake stuff up and that I feel good about. Um, I, yeah, I feel good about this moment um, and that we're able to reorganize to do to get better outcomes. Yeah, thank you. And so we, I realize we've talked a lot peripherally about Camden Town, but do you mind spending a couple of minutes just explaining of really what the vision of the future of Camden Town looks like? Yeah, before we get to the vision, I'll give you the past real quick. My wife, um, late wife, was working at um, U.S. Bank, crushing it. I mean, moving up, getting close to SVP level. Um, loved her job. And we had built a house in Robbinsdale. Uh, and we also spent a lot of time at the barbershop. Um, her, her mom actually lived above the, in the apartment that was above it. So we were always around. Um, and we did a lot of things there. You know, we had events and hosted people. And my wife came to me and said, like, I want to go to D.C., Chicago, or... New York, I think. Like, we're out of here. I, I can't do this anymore. Minnesota just... And so I discovered that there are a whole lot of other folks who had the same trepidation. They love their jobs. They love Minnesota, but it's just, there's no place for Black folks. Like, really a place. And so I, I said to Danny, he's like, Let, let's use our space. Let's just, let's just create what we want. And so that's really how Camden Town was born. And me being a real estate guy I said, well, we can build things in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a neighborhood, in an area and be a catalyst to create this kind of black epicenter, if you will. And so that's kind of how it started. And over the years, you know, I, I understood that we needed to create a sense of placemaking. And so you needed a, an event or something that really symbolized what Camden Town would feel like. And so that we created this uh, a place-based initiative, which, uh, well, uh, event, which was Camden Town Blues and Barbecue. And we did that the first year, 2019 summer. And there were about 3,000 people who came out. Uh, Jelly Bean Johnson was the headliner. I mean, it was an amazing event. There was a woman who came up to me and she gave me a hundred bucks, uh, a black woman. And she said, she gave me a big hug and she said, baby, this was so amazing. I, I just want to contribute to next year. Uh, and it, it was really a great event, man. But it, it was our, it's, it, it was creating our Rondo days, our Brando days, our up, Uptown Art Festival. And so I felt like we were putting in motion the, the, the building blocks of place. And um, 
2020, early, early 2020, we had a meeting with Brian Cornell here at the shop and Target had agreed to be uh, our sponsor for the 2020. And then we know what happened in 2020. I always say it's like dreams deferred, <laughs> paused. And so we couldn't do the Blues and Barbecue obviously last year. <clears throat> and we're gonna do a version of it this year, but in, in creating this sense of place, we started to say, all right, let's start to build a, a corridor and then let's start to work on recruitment of people to live in community while we're it's kind of this this multi-pronged approach of creating uh place-based events building out um, a node that becomes like emblematic of the downtown area if you will and then recruiting people to live in community because that's the way you build generational wealth that's the way you find your tribe and then let that solve for a lot of the things that are, are troubling in black communities. Schools are funded by the tax base. We got to increase the tax base. Public safety and all these kinds of things are a direct result uh, of who lives in the community and having people participate in, in bettering their neighborhood. So Camden Town literally, man, um, started out of, out of a, a, a need of mine. And I'm one that after so much complaining, you got to do something or shut the hell up. And so for me, the Camden Town is the do. Yeah, I read the the quote of you wanted to buy back in. And I, I just love that the the concept of the intentionality, the acknowledgement, um, you know, and, and you're a leader in the community. Um, so want to pause other questions. Um, we have about 15 more minutes um, before we wrap up. Oh, and we're looking for interns and, and contributors, by the way. So if y'all are interested, put it in the chat. April will grab it. Uh, love to have some really dope um, business-minded folks on board, so. Could you talk a little bit about what the internship looks like or kind of like what you're looking for? No. <laughs> because we're designing it right now. Uh, but I'll tell you, um, it, it's, it's really about finding people and then leveraging their skills, right? It, someone may say, well, I am interested in, 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 I'm a numbers person or I'm a techie person, right? Like you, you gotta, we have any number of needs. Um, I'm one that I try to design jobs around the people, the good people, uh, and you'll get better outcomes than trying to like force somebody into something that they're not gonna, you know, so it's more about meeting the person, finding the people, and then designing. I mean, we have parameters, but you know, I'm an entrepreneur, so rigid lines don't work for me. <laughs> well, Houston, it. My name is Greg and I work with a lot of different nonprofits and it seems like there's so many now that are really, you know, kind of scrambling to become, you know, diversified, inclusive and, and uh, you know, what you're saying about kind of creating a place and tribe is just, I mean, it, it really resonates because, you know, my feeling is that a lot of them are, are trying to go through the motions, you know, but they really don't know what to do. They're not, they're not reflecting anything that it seems like what you're saying. <laughs> kind of needs to be done. And I'm just wondering if there's a, you know, a way for you to, to help apply this to, you know, brought more broadly to kind of the sector, if you will. Because my worry is, is that there's a lot of white people out there scrambling to, you know, become relevant. Um, and that the interest is there, but the connection really isn't. And then the, the which means that the opportunity could be lost. And I, t I talk to, I work a lot in the outdoor worlds, I mean, outdoor recreation and environment and that kind of thing. And this guy, Dudley Edmiston, I don't know if you know him, you know, he kind of wrote a book about what was it, black and brown faces in, in public places or national parks, that kind of thing. And he told me, he said, you know, he said, Greg, you know, black people don't want to come and be a part of a white person's organization. <laughs> <laughs> he just said it bluntly, you know, so don't even try. I mean, you know, you're wasting your time to, to, to try that. 
And it just resonated to me that it made a lot of sense. And what you're saying makes a lot of sense with a place to feel comfortable. And I'm just wondering how we can, and this may be too big of a question for this, but how can we get, how can we educate people to have them understand kind of the things that you're saying so that we can start to move forward here more, you know, more productively? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is a very interesting time. And um, I, I think, you know, in this moment, there's, there's, there's money grab going on on one side because there's a lot of resources flowing. And so I've seen a lot of new things created to either hold off or stave off outside influence or appropriation, if you will, like in the development space, for instance, a lot of institutions created to go and secure land, which that's a good thing. But the, the real core of this is about people, some of our best people, some, some of the people who, who really would love to live in community are miseducated about, say, for instance, North Side. And I think our time and, and our efforts have been so widely dispersed that, that their the effect is not is not felt. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I think there are, I, I mean, I met with a, a bunch of foundation heads over the last year. And there is this 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 consensus that we've gotten it, we're getting it wrong, at least where black is concerned. And so we want to pause. So I, I do feel like folks have acknowledged or are starting to acknowledge um, that it's really about people in place if we're going to move this forward and i think with this project that we're about to start uh, we've, we've started to get a lot of national um press that we can be intentional about like creating a comms package that really hones in on that message that it's about community 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 um and you know how it goes people want to be a part of a, a winner and so you start creating momentum and traction, and I think it'll it'll continue to it'll continue to build. It's just about getting the right people at the table who can bring their influence and resources to to, to really amplify that it's community first, it's people, and then when you start to see small wins, you know, when you start to see things happening, when you start to see businesses created on a corridor and you start to see people want to move in, um, which we have 19 young families that have organically moved into Camden Town, but it's, a, it's for us now to really highlight that. We've started to do some of this work is to explain that, uh, for instance, there's a young attorney from, from Indiana who now lives in community. He built a house uh, in Camden Town and his partners from his law firm are now coming to North Minneapolis to eat dinner at his house. You know, that's a narrative shift. That's a, it's a very small thing, but that's a very big thing, you know? And so to continue to pile up on these, um, these small wins. And I, I mean, I talked to RT, I talked to a lot of folks about um, the need to direct resources directly into this. Uh, and then for all the folks who love white paper and studies, you get direct results of more people are moving in. It's gonna create a direct uh, link to wealth creation. It's gonna help um, these companies who are having a nightmare retaining and recruiting people of color, figure out like, you know what? When I got a black hire or somebody that I wanna bring into Minneapolis, instead of taking them to Woodbury or wherever, you can take them to a place that feels right and then let them make the decision, right? They might decide Camden Town's not for them, but right now they you don't even have that option. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, and I and I agree. This is the, this is the moment. Um, if 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 we don't over the next five six months really hone in, um, I think it will be a lot of good intent lost, and a lot of dollars without a real place to be used. So one of the last things I want to make sure we're asking, because you spoke about it a little bit earlier, but uh, this idea of excellence, it feels all the different, um, you know, lanes that you've played in, 
you've always been really intentional about brand. Is that something that you would say you you grew up with or you had an idea of, you know, vision what what brand was um, that you wanted to create? Um, or, or how have you applied that to, you know, different ventures? Yeah, um, the South, that's a Southern tradition, you know? Um, excellence is how my grandmother set the table every Sunday. Um, excellence is the expectation um, of how you present yourself and the reality that coming from small black owned businesses, excellence was the difference between making money for your family or not, right? Like. The one thing that people can agree on, even in Mississippi, where it's very, especially when my family grew up, very racist place, is the person that does a phenomenal job. I could, they could be my worst enemy if they're going to deliver an excellent project product. That's what I mean, you know. And so, that is brand, right? Like brand is being intentional about it, being exceptional. Um, and I, I, it, it started. For, that's my family, right? That's my mom you know, who sent me out of the house every day and made sure I was put together. Um, the expectation that you would be polite, you know, those are just Southern values that you learn. They're also good business value. It's like Mercedes, you know, that brand you trust because they deliver um, on a certain promise or at least they try to. Um, and so that's, that's key to me, you know, brand and, and having a sense of exceptionalism is, is very important. Any uh, final questions? Super appreciative, Houston and April as well. Thank you both for taking so much time uh, today to speak with us. Oh, for sure. It's a pleasure. April saying something in the chat, I think. Did you open it? Yeah, one thing Houston often says is Black should never be associated with lack. I like that. Yeah. yeah I should never be associated with lack. <laughs> and so, yeah, maybe that is, you know, uh, end where we started. You, you talked about the fact that, you know, college is certainly not the only opportunity to success. I think one of the, the through lines there is this idea of taking initiative. And for all of our students, after they graduate, that need to continue to take initiative in whichever venture you want to get into. To. Any you know, final advice for our students who are all going to be graduating very soon? Yeah, I mean, the best ticker symbol is your initials. Um, and you got to bet big on yourself, you know? I mean, there's no one in the world that has had your lived experience. When I go in boardrooms and I talk to CEOs, and I don't have their education, but I, they don't have my lived experience. And so I am uniquely qualified to be wherever I am. And so I think it's just always that sense of self-respect and self-belief that you are enough, you know? I mean, that's, that's key. All information can be gained. <laughs> Money can be gotten and lost, it's irrelevant. But, you know, the stuff that's in here and in here is, um, is the real value. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's always sad that we can't be in person, but at least I do feel like these opportunities wouldn't be possible, you know, without this virtual. So really appreciate it. Um, and I can't believe when I talked to you yesterday and you said it was going to snow, I did not realize we were getting snow. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I got a construction project going on. This holds me up. So I'm like, come on, Minnesota. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, right. we will close out class from here. Thank you so much, uh, both Houston, April. Um, and then we'll also follow up with that email uh, as students are interested in that internship opportunity. Yeah, I'd love it. Please uh, come on over. We're going to do some really fun, cool stuff this summer. Sounds great. Great. Thank you. See ya. Uh, and then I will just share my screen to close out with uh, homework. So we'll be meeting. Uh, you have April's email. If you're interested in that uh, internship opportunity, 
feel free to follow up uh, if you have more questions. On Thursday, remember end of the day, project two uh, updates are due at the end of the day. Um, if there's any questions, uh, Greg, Leah, and myself will hang back. Otherwise, have a great day. Thanks all.